on World News Tonight. Jab Jeopardy. Johnson & Johnson faces scrutiny amidst newly discovered side effects. Uncertain results. WHO warns against nations that resort to mixing jabs due to the lack of supplies. Green future. Amidst climate crisis around the globe, the EU sets its eyes on fighting pollution. A cat Pacino. Walls of pink to secure a loving future for furry little paws. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from another possible setback on the fight against COVID. The single-dose Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine was warned from the FDA of an increased risk of a rare but serious risk of a neurological disorder in the six week after inoculation. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration issued a warning for Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine, saying data suggests an increased risk of a rare autoimmune disorder called Guillain-Barre. Also known as GBS, the syndrome is a rare neurological condition in which the body's immune system attacks the protective coating on nerve fibers. Most people fully recover. In a Monday letter to the company, the FDA said the chances of getting GBS was, quote, very low, but still warned that recipients of the J&J &J vaccine should seek medical attention if they show symptoms within six weeks of inoculation, including weakness, tingling sensations, difficulty walking, or difficulty with facial movements. Most cases were in men over the age of 50. Nearly 13 million people have received J&J's one-dose vaccine in the U.S. Out of 100 preliminary reports of GBS, the FDA says 95 cases have required hospitalization and one death has been reported. The warning is another setback for the J&J shot, as its one-dose system was supposed to help vaccinate hard-to-reach areas. Last week, European regulators issued a similar warning for AstraZeneca's vaccine, which uses technology like J&J's, a traditional virus-based approach. Meanwhile, the FDA has not linked GBS to the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer-BioNTech and Moderna. A chief scientist at the World Health Organization has warned against an emerging practice of mixing COVID-19 vaccines. Speaking during an online briefing, Saumya Swaminathan described the practice of combining vaccines from different manufacturers as a dangerous trend. People who are um, thinking about mixing and matching. Uh, the World Health Organization's chief scientist on Monday advised against people mixing and matching COVID-19 vaccines from different manufacturers calling it a dangerous trend since there is very little information on doing so. So it's a it's little bit of a dangerous trend here where people are in a, in a data-free, evidence-free zone as far as a mix and match. There is limited data on mix and match. It will be a chaotic situation in countries if citizens start, you know, deciding when and who uh, they should be taking a second or a third or a fourth dose. Dr. Somya Swaminathan made her comments during the WHO's latest online briefing. Infectious disease experts are weighing whether people who received Johnson & Johnson's single-dose vaccine should receive a booster of the Pfizer or Moderna mRNA-based vaccine, which are said to be more effective against the highly contagious Delta variant. One of those who did mix and match is Dr. Angela Rasmussen, a researcher at the University of Saskatchewan's Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, who made headlines after she said on Twitter that she had gotten a dose of Pfizer's vaccine in June after receiving J&J's in April. She also advised other J&J recipients, especially those living in areas with low vaccination rates, to talk to their doctors about doing the same. Separately, Pfizer is pushing U.S. and European regulators to authorize a third booster shot to supplement its two-dose regimen. But health officials, including the WHO's Swaminathan, have said there is no medical evidence that a third Pfizer shot is necessary. It has to be based on the science and the data, not on individual companies. Instead of offering booster shots to highly vaccinated wealthy nations, the WHO's Director General on Monday said companies like Pfizer should send those vaccines to the WHO to give to poorer countries whose unvaccinated citizens desperately need them against a Delta variant he described as, quote, 
ripping around the world at a scorching pace. The Gavi Alliance has said that it has signed two advanced purchase agreements with Chinese drug makers Sinopharm and Sinovac to provide COVID-19 vaccines to the COVAX program immediately. To give us an update on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent Danushka Amaravansa joining us now from Geneva in Switzerland. Danushka? Yes, Anuradi. The new deals include up to 170 million doses of the Sinopharm shot and up to 380 million shots of the Sinovac vaccine through mid-2022. Soumya Swaminathan, the chief scientist of the World Health Organization, said at a press conference that she was glad to see that the two Chinese vaccines have entered COVAX and will be made available from July. Swaminathan said that these doses are very much needed at present for the many countries expecting vaccines. Gavi, which runs the global vaccine sharing scheme COVAX with the WHO, did not provide immediate details of which countries would receive the doses. Chief Executive Seth Berkeley said deliveries could start quickly because both vaccines have been granted the emergency use listing by the WHO. The WHO claimed on 1st June when it approved Sinovac shot that the results showed it prevented symptomatic diseases in 51% of those vaccinated and prevented hospitalization in 100% of the population studied. When it approved the shot in early May, the WHO said that the Sinopharm vaccine has an estimated efficacy of 79% for all age groups. Back to you, Anuradi. Thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Danish Kamarwansa reporting from Geneva in Switzerland. French President Emmanuel Macron gave a televised address to the French nation as the Delta variant of COVID-19 surges in the country. To elaborate on this, we have Other There in a World News special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna joining us now from Normandy in France. Chetana? Yes, Anuradhi. French President Emmanuel Macron began his address by speaking about a surge in infections of the COVID-19 Delta variant in mainland France and its overseas territories and urged French citizens to get vaccinated. Macron explained that the government was striving to achieve a 100% vaccination rate across the country. Vaccination will become a mandatory for all health workers. Macron urged them to be inoculated by September 15th after which they could face potential sanctions or fines. France's health minister Olivier Véran said that the non-vaccinated health workers won't receive a salary or be allowed to work after September 15. According to the president, PCR tests will no longer be free of charge from the autumn unless they are obtained with a prescription. It is hoped that the measure will drive up vaccination rates by encouraging people to get the vaccine rather than just repeated COVID-19 tests. Soon after the president's address, France online health portal Dr. Lib.fr crashed because of too many people trying to book a vaccination appointments. Back to you, Anurad. Thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Chetana Dharmaratna reporting from Normandy in France. Chanting freedom and calling for President Miguel Diaz to step down, thousands of Cubans joined street protests from Havana to Santiago in the biggest anti-government demonstrations of the communist-run island in decades. And U.S. President Joe Biden called for Cuba's leaders to hear their people, asserting their fundamental and universal rights. Cuba on Monday blamed the historic protests that took place from Havana to Santiago over the weekend on the U.S. embargo with the Caribbean island nation. Thousands chanted freedom and called on President Miguel Diaz-Canel to step down in the biggest anti-government demonstrations on the communist-run island in decades. From the White House, U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday threw his support behind the protesters. The United States stands firmly with the people of Cuba as they assert their universal rights. And we call on the government, government of Cuba, to refrain from violence and their attempts to silence the voice of the people of Cuba. At the same time, Cuban President Miguel Diaz-Canel attacked what he called Washington's hypocrisy for expressing concern when it was fueling the crisis in Cuba with its trade embargo. Is it not very hypocritical and cynical that you block me and you want to present yourself as the big savior? Lift the blockade and then we'll see what Cubans are capable of. 
The United States had tightened sanctions on Cuba under Trump, Biden's predecessor, including restricting crucial remittances in the middle of the global health crisis. Biden campaigned on easing sanctions but has yet to do so. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador backed Cuba, saying the U.S. economic embargo should be ended. The protests erupted amid Cuba's deepest economic crisis since the fall of the Soviet Union and a surge in infections that has pushed some hospitals to the edge of collapse in a country that prides itself on its health care system. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. The U.S. West endured a fourth day of scorching heat as temperatures again threatened to shatter records. Major wildfires burned nearly unchecked in drought-stricken Oregon and power grids strained under the pressure. A punishing heat wave was again forecast to bring near-record high temperatures to many parts of the U.S. West on Monday as a wildfire raged out of control in drought-stricken Oregon. The so-called bootleg fire had burned through more than 150 acres as of Monday morning, and crews have made little progress containing the blaze. The flames were burning along a high-voltage power corridor connecting Oregon's power grid with California's, worrying officials in both states that electricity could be knocked out to thousands of homes and businesses. Hundreds of residents in the Klamath Falls area in south-central Oregon were under mandatory evacuation orders, and county officials said police began issuing citations to enforce them and will consider the unusual step of making arrests if necessary. In California, scorching temperatures of 120 degrees Fahrenheit over the weekend at Joshua Tree National Park failed to keep visitors away, including a newlywed couple from New Jersey. It's the hottest place on earth. Like, this is hot. It's never been hotter. <laughs> it feels like we're in an oven, yeah. Like, actual, the air feels hot, yeah. It's hot. <laughs> Even visitors from typically hot climates were surprised at the sweltering heat. I came from the Caribbean and came from Dominican Republic, from a really hot country, and it's still hot for me. So I'm trying my best. Monday's forecast comes a day after California's Death Valley hit a scorching 130 degrees Fahrenheit, one of the highest temperatures ever recorded on Earth. The unseasonable heat wave triggered by a lingering high-pressure system is already the third for the region this year, an anomaly that some experts have attributed to climate change. We have some good news for you. As Mother Nature takes revenge on most parts of the globe, the European Union is set to take the lead in climate policy action among the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitters this week, with a raft of ambitious plans designed to cut emissions drastically over the next decade. Temperatures are approaching 50 degrees in parts of Spain. But as extreme heat events grow more common, the EU is to unveil a raft of ambitious plans designed to cut greenhouse gas emissions. They would put the bloc on track to meet its 2030 goal of reducing planet warming emissions by 55% from 1990 levels. The Fit for 55 package, set to be released on Wednesday, will face months of negotiations between the 27 EU countries and the European Parliament. The European Commission will propose 12 policies targeting energy, industry, transport and heating buildings. Its draft measures aim to encourage companies and consumers to choose greener options over polluting ones. By making climate policies more visible to EU citizens than ever before, Fit for 55 is also set to test public support for ambitious climate action. But the bloc is prepared for industry pushback. Europe's steel and cement sectors are already fighting plans to end free CO2 permits, and some of the sectors due to be covered by a carbon border tariff say they do not want to be included. Other major economies, including top emitters China and the US, have committed to achieving net zero emissions which scientists say the world must reach by 2050 to avoid catastrophic climate change. The Biden administration has upheld a Trump-era rejection of nearly all of China's significant maritime claims in the South China Sea, warning Beijing that any attack on the Philippines would draw a U.S. response.
the Biden administration and the former Trump administration may have been deeply at odds over many issues, but China's claims in the South China Sea isn't one of them. On Sunday, the Biden administration upheld a Trump-era rejection, warning China that any attack on the Philippines in the highly contested region would draw a U.S. response under a mutual defense treaty. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says an armed attack on Philippine armed forces, public vessels or aircraft in the South China Sea would invoke military action from the U.S., reaffirming the position laid out by Trump's top diplomat, Mike Pompeo. The statement also comes ahead of this week's fifth anniversary of an international tribunal's ruling in favor of the Philippines against China's maritime claims around the Spratly Islands and the neighboring reefs and shoals, a ruling Beijing rejects. In response to Blinken's statement, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs on Monday urged the U.S. to stop hyping up the issue, calling it extremely irresponsible. The spokesman added that the U.S. statement also disregards the historical merits and objective facts of the South China Sea issue, violating and distorting international law, and breaks the U.S. government's long-held public commitment of not taking a position on the contested region. He added China will continue to firmly defend its sovereignty, rights, interests, and security in accordance with international law. Much of Iraq's healthcare system is in poor condition after years of conflict and at least 50 people were killed and over 67 injured in a fire likely caused by an oxygen tank explosion at a coronavirus hospital in Iraq's southern city of Nasiriya. Dozens have been killed after a fire broke out at a coronavirus hospital in Iraq on Monday. That's according to health officials and police who said the fire was likely caused by an oxygen tank explosion. The incident occurred in the southern city of Nasiriya. Health officials there said the fire had been brought under control, but they also said thick smoke was making it difficult to maneuver in the building. One health worker told that many patients were trapped in the coronavirus ward, with rescue crews struggling to reach them. The office of Iraq's Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kadimi said in a statement he was holding urgent meetings with senior ministers and has ordered the suspension and arrest of health and civil defense managers in the city. The statement said that also included the hospital manager. Iraq, which has suffered from years of war and sanctions, frequently sees accidents due to underinvestment, corruption, and wrecked infrastructure. Monday's fire was a blow to its healthcare system, already struggling with an influx of patients and short supplies in the midst of the global health crisis. More than 1.4 million people are infected there, with a death toll of more than 17,000. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa said that the looting and violence following his predecessor Jacob Zuma's imprisonment is damaging efforts to rebuild the economy in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. South Africa's horizon was blotted with smoke on Monday as a weekend of sporadic looting and violence, prompted by the jailing of former President Jacob Zuma, continued to rage. Unrest by pro-Zuma supporters has been focused on his home province, KwaZulu-Natal. Footage showed a mall set ablaze in its capital, Pietermaritzburg, and looting in KwaZulu-Natal's biggest city, Durban. But the disorder has also spilled to South Africa's main commercial city, Johannesburg. National intelligence body NatJoints reported that six people have been killed in violent protests since last week, and more than 200 arrested. On Sunday, President Cyril Ramaphosa said people's lives and efforts to rebuild the economy amid the coronavirus pandemic were being endangered. Zuma was sentenced to 15 months in prison for contempt of court after failing to appear before a corruption inquiry. On Monday, he was back in court, asking for his jail term, which he started last week, to be rescinded. Legal experts say his chances of success are slim. Zuma and his supporters say he's the victim of a political witch hunt orchestrated by Ramaphosa's allies. But police say that anger is now being exploited by criminals to steal and cause damage. And on Monday, South Africa's military said soldiers would be deployed to help quell the unrest. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute.
During the upcoming Tokyo Olympics, athletes that test positive for COVID-19 and are unable to compete will be categorized as DNS or did not start rather than disqualified. Organizers say the rule has been included in the sports-specific regulations. UNESCO expressed strong regret over Japan failing to fully implement its promises regarding the history of forced labor at areas designed as World Heritage Sites. This follows the global body's infection in Tokyo last month. More people are suffering from starvation as the coronavirus pandemic continues to linger. A report issued jointly by five UN agencies has shown around 10% of the global population faced hunger in 2020. International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach praised Tokyo 2020's efforts in preparing for a secure and safe Games as the start date of the world's biggest sports event fast approaches. And finally tonight, at the Gatto Cafe in downtown Rio de Janeiro, coffee and tea are served with whiskers and a purr. In its pink-walled interior, customers can purchase lattes dusted with cat silhouettes and accompanied by paw-shaped biscuits while cats lounge lazily in an adjacent room. Cat cafes were first popularized in Asia, where they originated in Taiwan in 1998. In addition to offering a feline company, Gato Cafe, which opened last July, simultaneously functions as an adoption site for abandoned cats rescued by an organization called Bigodes do Bunker. In 2019, there were over 78 million pet cats and dogs in Brazil, according to the Brazilian Pet Institute, as owners passed away and families were thrown into disarray during the coronavirus pandemic, many animals were abandoned or left to fend for themselves. Many customers said they were having the time of their life as they stroked a tabby with white patches. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.